So good evening. The EPFL Library is happy to welcome you for this second uh, evening of Open Science Talk. Today we will talk about publication and we will have three uh, international venues and we are very honored about that. Um, talking about publication means that uh, the traditional publication uh, has greatly evolved during the last decades and we are facing now to new publishing platform to open access initiative, open science initiative. And with these three talks, we will have an overview of new uh, initiatives that uh, are on uh, open science. Um, um, <laughs> on open science. So, uh, talks will um, take 15 minutes and we'll have each five minutes for dic discussion after. <coughs> and you are warmly welcome to join for an aperitif after these three talks and to continue the discussion and exchanges with the speakers and each of them. So today, program publication, we'll have a first talk uh, on preprint, a second one on science matters, uh, a new platform. First talk by Jessica Polka. Jessica Polka is a biologist. She's a visitor, a scholar at the Whitehead Institute, <laughs> which is a biomed institute, a biomed non-profit institute. And she's also the director of ASAP Bio, which is a um, scientist-driven initiative who aims to promote the use of preprint in life sciences. She will present the benefits, the challenges, of uh, using this preprint in this new um, landscape of publication. After that, we have, we'll have the second talk given by Lawrence Rajendran, who is professor uh, at the Zurich University. Uh, Lawrence is an expert of the cell biology for um, Alzheimer's disease, and he's also the founder of Science Matter, a new open access platform, which aims to publish single observation uh, instead of the full developed stories that uh, we have the, um, we used to have in the traditional journal publication. And the uh, third and the last talk for tonight will be given by Kirsty Whitaker, showing you working, so it will be about reproducibility. Kirsty Whitaker is a research uh, fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, and she's also a Mozilla a fellow for science. She's really passionate for open science and she will talk about uh, reproducibility of research. Uh, she will uh, talk about the barriers that researchers uh, have when they want to make their science reproducible. So uh, let's start with Jessica. The floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. And uh, it's wonderful to see uh, all of you here for what um, I'm very excited to hear these talks uh, later tonight as well. The first day was a fantastic introduction, I don't know how many of you are here, to the overall pressures that researchers face when they are uh, basically making our work public. And I think that um, just to sort of recap and, and restate this challenge, science, of course, is an incredibly collaborative endeavor that requires all of us to make our findings public in order to uh, lay the foundation for the next level of discovery. Um, every, every work that we do is based upon the findings of our predecessors. Um, and so publication and sharing that information is absolutely essential. Um, but I think the challenge is that for so many of us, including especially for early career researchers, it can feel like publishing is actually a race. That rather than building something together, we are competing against one another. We are struggling to uh, scoop someone or, or be scooped by someone. We're trying to get a paper in before a fellowship. Um, it, the individual needs of a researcher, as we heard yesterday, are not often very well aligned with the kinds of practices that would ideally benefit scientists and research as a whole. Um, but I think that one, um, one of the, the main reasons why so many open science initiatives, I think, are difficult is that sometimes we're asking researchers to think about the interest of uh, science as a whole when, in fact, we have our own needs um, to, in, in terms of self-preservation and, and career advancement. The incentives, as we heard, are not well aligned with uh, a lot of the practices. However, I think whichever way you're looking at science, 
Uh, speed is beneficial. Speed is beneficial to the individual researcher when they're trying to get their work out. Speed is also beneficial because the faster new discoveries are made public, the faster they can uh, contribute to new findings. So um, this is a, a challenge because a traditional publishing can sometimes hide work for months or years. Um, a researcher will submit their manuscript to a journal. Um, if everything goes smoothly and the peer review process proceeds, um, then that will result in the emergence of a peer-reviewed paper. But oftentimes, um, reviewers are not as friendly <laughs> uh, as, as they uh, might be in the end. The paper improves. This process is important. It's valuable. Um, but the result is that this work is sometimes hidden from broader community feedback, broader ideas and discussion for a very long time. So one way to address this challenge is to use preprints. So preprints um, are manuscripts that are shared online before the completion of journal organized peer review. The concept would be that if I were to write a manuscript um, right around the time that I might submit it to a journal, um, this is not the final version of the paper, I would post it on an online preprint server. Um, after submitting it, my colleagues would screen the paper, uh, kind of look through and, and understand, is this really a scientific paper? Um, are there any kind of major uh, ethical problems with it? After which time, maybe 24, 48 hours, it would be posted online uh, on the web where it's exposed to the whole community for feedback and, and discussion. Um, and I want to note that this complements rather than replaces um, peer-reviewed papers. It's really important that we have mechanisms for curating and improving work. Um, but rather, the preprint is just a way of getting that information out there sooner so that uh, more, more discussion can happen. It's also important for me to note that preprints are permanent. So they're not just an ephemeral Facebook post uh, that you can delete. They're really a, a, a research object that has a DOI that can be versioned and updated with new versions as, uh, as the researcher improves the paper. And um, as such, they're citable. There's this expectation that they're persistent um, and they're going to be found in the same place. So they can be referred back to as a scholarly work. Now, this um, mechanism of communication is widespread in many other disciplines. I'm going to talk about physics because obviously, um, you know, clearly probably there's many physicists in the audience, I would imagine. Um, but it, this has been a common practice for 25 years. There's over 100,000 uh, preprints posted on the archive every year. Uh, so this is very much embedded in, in the way that science is done. So uh, ASAP Bio, which is a small uh, group of, of researchers, um, we, uh, about two years ago, organized a meeting to discuss whether preprints uh, could play a larger role in the life sciences community. Um, and uh, you know, really, over the last uh, couple of years, there's been a really dramatic increase in the use, utilization of preprints, um, where there's been rapid growth of um, especially bioarchive, which is specialized for preprints in the, in the life sciences. Um, but it's not only that, it's also that there's a, a kind of real sort of uh, renaissance in, in many preprint servers in many disciplines. Um, so for example, um, at, at the bottom of the, the screen here, Med Archive was just announced uh, earlier this month. Earth Archive and ESOR, which are two preprint servers for the uh, geosciences, are also um, coming into play. There's been announcements from Cielo um, and, and other kind of regional uh, preprint repositories are coming on the scene too. So why, why do people like preprinting? Um, I, I think that um, from my perspective, preprinting is like a great way to present your work as you would at a meeting um, to gain visibility, get additional feedback, um, help interested journal editors find you. There's a phenomenon where journal editors are essentially contacting preprint authors and asking them to submit their papers, find collaborators, Create a record of what was done on what date so that you can kind of unambiguously say, uh, you know, this is what we knew at this particular time and place, um, and demonstrate productivity for jobs and grants. I mean, I think all of these things are things that benefit an individual. But again, to me, the, the biggest motivation is this idea that this is a way to accelerate the whole process of discovery. 
So funders, I think for that reason, are particularly enthusiastic about preprints. And um, over the last year and a half, um, there have been a variety of different funders who have come out with policies that uh, favor and encourage the use of preprints. So um, Wellcome Trust, NIH, HHMI, um, MRC, EMBO, all of these uh, foundations have basically encouraged uh, the usage of preprints as a way of uh, documenting uh, productivity on a grant application or report. So I think that, um, uh, can I just see a show of hands of who in the audience has posted a preprint? Wow, that's pretty good. I think, <laughs> so who has read a preprint? Yeah, okay, so, oh, you, oh, wow, okay, I should have asked at the beginning, or I could have skipped a bunch of these slides. So I, I think that there is, um, you know, clearly when talking about preprints, many times people have concerns, and I'm eager to kind of hear, I'm going to leave some point times for questions um, that I, I'd like to hear what, you, what you're thinking. But um, I just want to talk about three sort of common issues um, to sort of uh, raise, the, raise them before you. So the first is a concern about scooping. This, I think, is particularly uh, a concern for researchers who are early in their career, who have a very short CV, who are for whom that the paper that they've been working on for five years during their PhD uh, or their postdoc is so important. Um, and so I think the, the idea here is that this is a word cloud generated from a survey that I did of the uh, EMBO postdoc fellows meeting. And I asked them what their major concern was with preprints. And so you can see very clearly that, that it's this fear that by putting work on a public server that is not uh, the traditional recognized way for researchers to communicate, that someone else, their competitor, might see that paper, incorporate the ideas, but not credit them. Uh, and so this, I think, is, is um, you know, something that obviously in physics, I think that the archive essentially functions as the place to look for, for papers. So it doesn't even make sense to consider that somebody you would scoop, it would be like scooping, you know, getting scooped by posting a paper, which actually, to be fair, I think can happen if there's a, a discrepancy in the, the visibility of the journals. And it, in along those lines, there are many uh, ways of going to a meeting, presenting a poster, submitting a paper for peer review, uh, submitting a grant where these, um, that this type of behavior can, can occur. So I would say that a, that a preprint actually does help you prevent being scooped because it provides you with a public time-stamped uh, record of what you had done at a certain time. Second concern is, what about journals? Um, you know, I think that there's a tremendous variety in journals that are uh, accepting and friendly to preprints, um, in the life sciences in particular. Um, but there are two great resources for discovering which journals are friendly to preprints across all disciplines. Uh, Wikipedia has a page that you can edit called List of Academic Journals by Preprint Policy. It's very easy to use, and it can contain information that is uh, kind of nuanced about what, uh, what exactly the versions that you can post, et cetera. Sharpa Romeo has a very comprehensive listing of journals and their self-archiving policies, including preprints as well. But of course, it's important to double, double check the journal website. Um, the third concern is that by generating preprints, and we talked about this a little bit last night, that um, we're basically just overloading uh, our information, that we are putting too much information out into the world. Uh, and that perhaps that, that information might be of low quality, that, other, that we're somehow degrading our filter system by putting information out into the, into the public. I mean, I, I would say to that that sharing work before peer review is something that we're already doing all the time. Um, and clearly, uh, in physics, this has not caused the implosion of the field. Uh, it's, and, and I think it, it makes sense, because much as the same way that life scientists and, and uh, really all scholars are presenting their work in some form uh, to some audience before peer review. So I might go to a meeting and present a poster, um, but I would not want to put complete nonsense on the poster because I need to go stand next to that poster. And I think that there's a certain effect that's, that is comparable with um, with preprints. You know, you don't necessarily need to, you can't physically stand next to your preprint, but still there is this need to associate your name with it. And so I think that that reputational, uh, need to pr preserve reputation is going to play into the, the quality. And I think the second concern is that somehow citing preprints 
will uh, exacerbate the problem of perhaps less reliable information uh, circulating. So there's been a a lively debate on Twitter and on vlogs um, about whether scientists should cite preprints, and and these are life scientists, I think. Um, And you know, I'm sure that those the physicists in the room are probably like you know shaking their heads at all of this. But um, the the concern is that um, preprints, if they they can become cited, they could propagate. Um, unreliable information through the literature, but I think that only that makes the assumption that no one is reading the papers that they're citing or that that are being cited. Um, it, it makes the assumption that a citation is not just a pointer to information, but some kind of um, certificate of veracity. That basically there's this expectation that peer review is going to make papers perfect when we know that it doesn't. Um, I think the major concern, though, with this debate about citing preprints is that the entire point of a preprint is to accelerate the transfer of knowledge and the transfer of information. Um, And if you were to prevent preprints from being cited or to create policies in journals that would prevent preprints from being cited, that would essentially force scholars who are really on the cutting edge to plagiarize information uh, without properly attributing it. So I think this is a a really interesting debate. We can talk about it more. But I just want to raise the uh, point that we have assembled some information about what preprints are, some frequently asked questions about preprints. There's a little video um, that kind of introduces the whole concept if there's you have colleagues who have uh, interest or questions about it. Um, we also are really interested in developing uh, people who are interested in talking about preprints in their home institutions. Um, I think it's uh, really important that preprints kind of come out of this um, digital uh, world that is very much associated with Twitter. Um, you know, I feel like you can go on Twitter and read about preprints all day long, but m- maybe by walking through the halls of many institutions, there's still there's still not a recognized concept. So we want to identify people who are really kind of passionate about preprints and willing to talk about them. Uh, and we call um, them this ASAP Bio Ambassador Program. So Tsubashika back there is, is one of them. Um, and uh, we hopefully would like to get kind of people all around the world who are willing to be listed on our website and contacted. The other thing that we're trying to do is bring these conversations about preprints outside of the sort of the bubble. That it, it's sometimes a little hard to find uh, preprint. They, they come up on Google Scholar. They're mentioned all the time at Twitter. I think people are starting to mention them at meetings more frequently. But it would be great to kind of have conversations with people who have not been exposed to them before. So to that end, we have these little sort of um, stickers, sort of a, a physical way of, of um, letting people know that you are interested in preprints. And we have a, a huge number of them over there by the little information uh, pamphlet stand. So please take them and share them. And I would be delighted to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so we, uh, we have time for questions. Um, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. One thing I wanted to ask is concerning retractions. Mm. So in the traditional publishing sense, it is the journal or the <coughs> author that initiates the retraction, and it goes through several months of discussion. Um, with regards to retraction of <coughs> blueprints, um, how do you foresee this working? Whose responsibility is it? Yeah. Just these questions. Absolutely, it's a very great, it's a fantastic question that I think is an area of active debate. Um, I know that preprint servers have different policies on on when manuscripts can be removed, um, and I think that there is certainly a uh, a case that clearly, if there's some kind of legal problem with having the information up there, that it should be removed. Um, I think the idea of posting a with a preprint, of course, one thing that exists that doesn't exist with a journal is the fact that the authors can upload a second version that will then um, be displayed when clicking on the DOI or clicking on the link. So that could be one way, if this is not an issue where there's really sensitive information that's present, of um, 
updating the preprint to say that you know we don't believe these these parts of uh, of the paper, et cetera. Um, I think that th this is a, de a debate that um, we as an organization are very interested in kind of bringing to broader communities and different stakeholders because I think the the best practices um, are are yet to be established in in the life sciences. It's a great question. Um, I have a follow-on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so you mentioned changing in version numbers. Um, so let's say there was a significant change between version one and version two. Um, then if version one has already caught traction within the scientific community, is then being propagated throughout uh, as a reputable source, and then this is changed to version two, isn't there then... Um, an issue that everything citing version one would then in itself need to be updated, whilst I can see that preprints themselves would be flexible in doing that. Yeah. Um, in again, the more traditional publishers, that would be something more hard to do. I think, that, yeah, I, you're making a, a, an excellent point, and I think the, but it's a problem that d appears not only with preprints, but also with retracted articles. I think Ivan Aransky of Retraction Watch has done a study on the number of times retracted articles get cited after they're retracted, and it's like a lot. So I think that the, the, there's, the, the, we don't have a, um, you know, clearly Crossref is doing great things with cross mark and, and developing ways for information to kind of try to propagate information about new corrections and, and new articles that would come up. But I think it really needs to be really visibly embedded in, in our whole like infrastructure. So one thing that preprint servers are doing is effectively um, uh, putting up, so for example, on BioArchive, if you go to an old version of the preprint, there's like a, a little thing that, that um, appears that says there's a new version of this preprint that is pretty visible. So I think making those things incredibly obvious is something that um, you know could be uh, enhanced even in the future. Um, the other thing is that if preprints were to be, tr um, in, unfortunately in, in uh, the life sciences, it's common practice to use PDFs for preprints. So there's not really any um, you know, normal text. Um, but you could imagine comparing the versions and it, it's doing some, uh, you'd have a, a mechanism of kind of highlighting what's different that would make it easier for researchers to track the changes over, over the course of the manuscript. <laughs> he has a very interesting history of um, preprints and PubMed. So Harold Varmus, um, who uh, uh, basically he proposed what was effectively PubMed Central. In the original proposal, it contained preprints. Um, I think that PubMed is pretty explicitly for peer-reviewed literature. Uh, however, Europe PMC has done a really interesting pilot where they've um, moved preprints that are under Creative Commons licenses on a, a small pilot um, onto Europe PMC, which is a really interesting experiment. So I would say that how do you find preprints? There's three great search engines. One is PrePubMed, which is by Jordan and Anaya. The uh, second one is osf.io, I think, slash preprint. So it's basically the Center for Open Sciences preprint search engine. And the third one is Google Scholar, which is a way to, of course, search all the literature. Um, and, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot more to be said about that, but I would say those are kind of like the three most functional ways. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Oh, thank you.